Father, as we reflect on this Good Friday and what it means and what Jesus means, speak to us now through your word. In his precious name we pray. Amen. And just for the benefit of those who might be watch, who will be watching this later, um, I'm going to give you the readings we've already had because we're not going to repeat them, obviously. Uh, we've had three readings and I'm going to be referring back uh, to one of them. And that's the three readings are Matthew 27, 32 to 44. Matthew 27, 45 to 54. And then we've had John 3, 13 to 21, which is really going to be my base reading uh, for what I say today. Following on uh, from what I preached a few weeks ago on John 3, except as you will have noticed if you were here then, I've overlapped a couple of verses uh, for the sake of good flow, I think, and because I think there's something important there as well. Last Sunday, which is only five days ago, um, we talked about She's put the foot on the brake. It's okay, sorry. Sorry, it needs to be done. Last Sunday, um, five days ago, we talked about dark clouds gathering as we escorted and saw Jesus entering Jerusalem and weeping over Jerusalem. And we've been considering, you know, the opposition that Jesus faced, how it mounted, and that once he enters Jerusalem, dark, dark clouds really start uh, to appear and arrive. They are gathering and a storm is brewing. If you can take us back, please, uh, Michael, to Matthew 27, 45 to 46. Sorry about this. That was it. Yeah, um, they should have been further down in the PowerPoint. Here it comes, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. That darkness, in a perceptible way, came and stood there, or stayed there, for three crucial hours, leading up to the Jesus' final cry, Ele, Ele, Lama Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is, of course, the start of Psalm 22. And like Isaiah 53, if you read Psalm 22, you'll be there hundreds of years before Jesus, looking at what he endured that day on the cross. And then again, on verse 50, when Jesus had cried out again, Possibly the, the final cry, it is finished, I've accomplished it. He gave up his spirit and died. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. And Derek's already referred a bit to the tombs breaking open. There was an earthquake. It wasn't just a storm when Jesus died, but some form of earthquake. And the hand of God doing something else that's very important. Tearing the temple curtain, which was that thick, as thick as a man's hand, from top to bottom. And that's why we say it's God doing it, because this curtain was much higher than this room. And if you're going to rip a curtain, you'd go from the bottom upward. And God is signifying that the way to the holiest place, the inner sanctuary of the temple, is open to people. Which takes us again to something I said a few weeks ago about Jesus in John 2, claiming the temple and that temple in time being handed on to his people through the spirit living in us. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And the word temple is the place for that inner sanctuary that God has just opened up when Jesus died there on the cross. The 
bit different, but very telling of how in dealing with our sin, Jesus died and there was a violent reaction. All the pain, all the suffering, all the nastiness that he'd gone through, and some of us reminded ourselves vividly of that because at our home group, we watched The Passion of the Christ. Uh, very, very vivid and very, very moving. Uh, if you've never seen it, even though it's nearly 20 years old, I'd still recommend it. Um, all that he went through and that laying on of sin where he feels separation from God. And however many times I've ever said that, my brain blows a little fuse because I cannot understand Jesus being separated from God. His own very self-being as the second person of the Trinity. It's virtually impossible, if not impossible. But somehow he feels totally and utterly, because of our sin, cut off from God. And our reading today, if we can take me back to John 3, please. Um, at verse 13. I've got, I'll put that up there, I'll read it better. I've got five headings. And it's all right, as I said to somebody before, I'm going to be shorter than Sunday. <laughs> so, <laughs> that minute. <laughs> yeah, I know, it was a bad one. So, the reason I repeated, really, verses 13 onwards to 15 is because of 14 and 15, which I want to say is a blast from the past. Verses 14 and 15, a blast from the past. If you remember what has reminded us of a few weeks ago, um, this reference to Moses and the serpent being lifted up in the wilderness was at the time that the children of Israel, they've just been drawn by God out of Egypt through the Red Sea, they're in the first camp and they're moaning already. Oh, the food is awful. And the complaints are there. And God got angry. Because they were rebellious and sinful. And rebellion precedes sin. Go back to the Garden of Eden. They rebelled against God's word, disobeyed it, and sin entered the world. And God sent venomous snakes. And they were getting bitten and dying. Which was awful. And Moses pleads on their people's behalf for them to be saved. And he's given the instruction about the serpent on a pole. But with the caveat, the provision, that if you get bitten and you want to live... You've got to look at the pole, the serpent on the pole. Otherwise, bad news, you're going to die. Look at the pole, look at the cross and live. Don't look, die. Don't look, die. The source for this action is verse 16, second heading. The source for action, this action, verse 16. Again, Derek just quoted it a few minutes ago. God so loved the world. God so loved the world, cosmos, that whoever believes individuals one by one in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is the promise. That is the source of God's action. That is the source for all that happens in the whole of the life of Jesus, because his whole life is a gift to us, but the ultimate is the ultimate sacrifice, as has been on our slides today, there on the cross, where he takes our sin upon him, totally and utterly, breaking its power over us, which is death, and maybe that's the whole understanding of the tomb shattering open, uh, and something strange, happening uh, when he died that God has broken it but of course it's through his blood that we are cleansed from that sin death breaks the his death breaks the hold of death over us but his blood cleanses us from sin just as the lambs that were sacrificed at Passover and other times were there the blood was put at the base of the altar 
symbolic of washing away of sin. This is the real thing. Jesus' blood drips to the bottom of his altar, the cross, and we are cleansed from sin. And the writer to the Hebrews says, all that was before was sort of a picture for the real thing. And I like to think it was sort of putting everything on hold. All those lambs down through the centuries that were slaughtered put people's sins on hold so that when Jesus died on the cross, they were dealt with. Because all are saved by the blood of the Lamb. All before and all after. You and me. That is, to use a posh word, the efficacy of the cross. That everybody, Moses is saved by Jesus on the cross. Elijah is saved by Jesus on the cross. But not until that moment, he's died. Not until that moment, he's died. And it's all done because of love. Steadfast love. Covenant love. That's God's love. That special love. Thirdly, first part of verse 17 and the first part of verse 18. Under the heading, hope to live by. Hope to live by. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not (coughs) condemned. This is a repeat of what happened in the wilderness with the serpent. Biting people and people dying and having to look at the pole. And I don't want to always hit it, but it's there. And there's no getting away from it. God is not happy with sin since Jesus has died. He's still angry and he has a just judgment on sin. But our hope to live by is that because Jesus has died, broken the power of death, we've got hope to live by. We've got hope to live by. To live this life now. Because if we are in Christ and Christ is in us, we are set free from death. Totally and utterly. Yes, the body will die. But we will be raised on the day of Christ with a new body that's imperishable and eternal. And there'll be no backache, no bad eyes, no whatever else. It'll all be dealt with. We will not be perishing anymore. (laughs) But, by contrast, second half of verse 18, under the heading, dread to die by. Dread to die by. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. See why I said God is not happy at sin at all? Jesus' death doesn't alter sin. It deals with it. And those whose sins are not dealt with are going to perish because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And it goes back to verse 16 that those who do not believe will perish. Back to verse 14. Those who didn't look at that serpent on the pole died. This is God's consistency and it's not changed. And there are people that say, oh, God of the New Testament is God of love. Nobody's going to suffer. They're all going to be let off. No, they're not. The plain word of God refutes and contradicts that totally and utterly. There is condemnation for those that are not in Christ. Everybody's condemned. I think that's what John is saying. Or Jesus through John. I'm not sure who's writing at this point speaking at this point but the whole world is condemned from Genesis 3 onwards to death but those who look at the Jesus on the cross and turn to him and believe in his name and live that are released from that condemnation no condemnation now I dread there is no condemnation but for those that are not This world needs to be in dread. But the time 
is still available to come out of condemnation. To look to Jesus, even on the deathbed, is fine. As somebody said, if it was on Facebook, the, the, the thief on the cross who speaks to Jesus and gets forgiven, that's it. All he had to do was repent and he's straight to paradise. Deathbed conversion is acceptable to Jesus. But you've got to do it before you die because there's no second chances. And if you'll roll on the screen, please. The judicial verdict. I thought that was a good heading for Good Friday. The because it's what we're dealing with. So much in the Bible is in the language of the courtroom. Quite a bit. It's courtroom language. And even righteousness is not guilty. Whereas sin is guilty. <clears throat> These sort of words, they have a courtroom thing. Um, the judicial version, the verdict, verses 19 to 21. This is the verdict. And I've got three subheadings. That fool, you didn't see. You didn't expect three subheadings as well. Um, and we're back to darkness, please note. We're back to darkness. The light has come into the world, verse 19, but people prefer darkness. Now, okay, we are reading this again, post-resurrection. John wrote this post-resurrection, and a lot of what he's referring to are those dark clouds that were going to gather through Jesus' ministry from John 2 onwards in his book, and all the discussions and the hard discussions he's going to have with the Jews, the leaders, and although he's helpful all the way, I don't think Jesus ever gave up hope that the Pharisees would turn to him and believe. I think all the way he's holding out that they will turn and accept him for who he is. But people preferred darkness to light. You know, it's cockroaches that light darkness, isn't it? And all the whatever creepy crawl is. Mushrooms, but they pop up into the light and then they're delightful. And, they grow. and once they pop into the light, they grow. Underground, they're just spores. And they pop into the light and they grow. Hmm, I think the picture's just taken on a new dimension. Thank you, Joe. Uh, people prefer darkness. You can't believe it, can you? Who really? Wonders, uh, sadly, yes, the, those who have no eyesight uh, will still benefit from the light, but have a trouble walking without light to see by. But the other things in the human wonderful makeup that God's given us allows a compensation. But who normally would want to live in darkness, in the cold, cut off from light? But this is what is implied in these words people prefer darkness to light. But for those, but there are people, and the people fear the light. That's the next one. Secondly, everyone who does evil hates the light. Which is what I was saying before about from Genesis 3 onwards, people have walked in darkness and not wanted the light. And God's been reaching out and reaching out and reaching out and reaching out all through the Old Testament. But the Old Testament's a story of people coming in and out of light and, and, and rejecting God time and time and time again. So like the parable of the tenants in the vineyard, God sends his son. And thereby, sin is dealt with. Because he is the light that's come into the world in a way that it was never there before to show the truth about God. And people feel their deeds being exposed. But in Christ, our deeds are forgiven and cleansed. Yes, we may be accountable on the day of judgment, but we're not in condemnation. And then finally, people who relish the light, verse 21. Living by the truth, living by Jesus and him alone, comes into the light and like that mushroom, they'll pop up, grow and develop into something that Johan doesn't like, but I actually think it's quite tasty. But that's true of other things. The bulbs, the flowers that pop up, they come up for the light of, the, of springtime, don't they? Um, 
and, and flourish. And we flourish when we come into the light of God. And it is in the light of God because what has, they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is God's work in us. His light shining on us to transform. And it's openly living before God. And I think that's what God calls us to, openly live before him and to share him. We live in a world that still prefers darkness to light. We are called to be light of the world, as well as the temple, as well as all sorts of other things. To shine in the darkness for Jesus. Let your light shine, so shine before people, men and women, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. They may come to him and be transformed themselves and blossom and flourish. And of course, John 3 itself came to flourish post-resurrection. And they looked and they saw the things Jesus had said, which were enigmatic when he spoke them. But the proverbial penny dropped at Pentecost, just to how wonderfully God had acted. And what all those things that they couldn't follow through the ministry of Jesus that he'd said fell into place, like the one we've just looked at again. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. So, and not until the cross that that could make sense. And it makes sense to us today. And may we share that sense with others that God loves them and has done something to save them and rescue them from condemnation and bring them to life. Amen.